In this video, I'm going to look at the validity of the lumped capacitance method. In the lumped capacitance method, we assume that there's no energy generation with constant properties and that the part in question that's changing temperature is all at a uniform temperature at one given time and that single temperature representing the entire object is changing with time. Looking at this control volume, we can see that our energy conservation means that the energy going out minus E out is balanced by the energy storage and using those constant properties we can use Newton's law of cooling to describe the energy out where the only thing changing is that temperature with respect to time and the energy storage term with these constant the volume constant and the volumetric heat capacity constant and the time rate of change so those assumptions allow us to use this equation which of course we can solve uh, to figure out the time variation of that object now when is that going to be valid assuming that the temperature is constant if you recall the buyout number was the resistance to conduction over the resistance to convection. And we have this expression that that was the convection coefficient times the length scale uh, divided by the conductivity of the solid. If the resistance to conduction is very, very small compared to the resistance to convection, then all of the temperature drop between this solid, think about the center of it, moving from the center out to the convection layer, all of that temperature drop is going to be in the convection layer because the resistance to conduction is virtually nothing in comparison to the resistance to convection. So in order for that assumption to be valid, we need for the buyout number to be much, much less than zero. And we need a length scale. This is our length scale, LS. Very often, we'll use a length scale that is the volume over the surface area. Sometimes we'll change that, and remember this is an order of magnitude analysis. We're looking for something that is much smaller than zero, and we're picking a representative length scale. In the absence of another reason, this isn't a bad one to go with, but of course in the example that follows, I'm going to end up using a different one. So let's look at a square of side one meter. It's a square, and so we can draw two axes of symmetry and end up looking at only a quarter of it. I'm going to say that the square starts out, the square part starts out with a temperature of 50 degrees. It's perhaps aluminum with a conductivity of 237 watts per meter Kelvin. And we'll say that outside there's a temperature of 100 degrees, so we're heating this up in a 100 degree environment. And the convection coefficient between the ambient and the surface is 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So as I said, we can look at symmetry and we can look just at this one corner of it. And we'll call our coordinate system the center at 0, 0, and we'll go out to 0 0.5 in the x direction and 0 0.5 in the y direction. So this corner out here is 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And we should calculate our buyout number. And in this case, I'm going to use a length scale of 0.5, this side length. Now, if you remember, sometimes in fluid mechanics, we talk about the hydraulic diameter, which is four times the cross-sectional area over the wetted perimeter. And that's the kind of argument that we make here. The reason we do that is because, of course, the perimeter of this square of one is four, and the cross-sectional area is 1. So if we looked at the length scale, AC over P, we would get 1 quarter. And of course, we would like the length scale in our square to be the square length. Much like if it's a circle, we'd like the, the length scale to be the diameter of that circle. And so if we define the length scale as 4 times the cross-sectional area over the perimeter, then we will get that the length scale is, of course, the side length. So I'm going to use that here. And remember, it's just an order of magnitude argument to help us out. So I'll use the length scale of 0.5. And for this example, then, the buyout number is 0.042, which is quite a bit less than 1, uh, but still noticeable. We're going to look at a second case where we increase the convection coefficient to 100. When we increase the convection coefficient to 100, now that buyout number is going to go up by a factor of 5 to 0 0.21. 0 0.21, we'll see, is not enough less than 1 to use the lump capacitance method effectively. So here's an animation starting at 50 degrees. We'll look first at the buyout number of 0.042. And at time zero, everything is at 50 degrees. And as we start heating that up, notice that the temperature is almost uniform across there. We're only ever seeing one contour line. So we're only changing a small amount of, uh, of one contour gradation over here as it heats up from 50 to ultimately uh, 100 degrees, or close to 100 degrees. When we increase the convection coefficient and correspondingly increase the buyout number, and we go through that process, you can see there's a much bigger temperature variation across here. Several contour gradations are here, uh, especially at the early times. Let's look at this in more detail. If we look at a plot for the low buyout number of the temperature in the blue line at the corner in the center of our object, sorry, at the center of our object, and with the red, uh, with the orange symbols at the outer corner here. At the low buyout number, 
These two temperatures are almost the same over this whole time trajectory. At the very early times, you can see a little bit of a difference. Whereas when we increase the Biot number to 0.21, the corner temperature heats up very, very quickly, heats up very, very quickly, and there's a delay as energy has to propagate inside towards that corner, and then you see a large difference between these two curves all the way uh, up to our latest time in this simulation. Now, of course, that's going to change, give us inaccurate results. We're basing the convection on this outer temperature. So the convection coefficient for the energy out really should be based on this temperature here, whereas the average temperature of the solid is some average between these two. And so our convection coefficient, uh, the energy being transferred from the, from the ambient to this part, is going to be at a slower rate. And so the energy transfer from the free stream to the part is going to be a, a smaller rate because we're basing it on the highest temperature when really we should base it on some average temperature. And therefore, the part will heat up more quickly. We will predict with the lump capacitance method that it will heat up more quickly than in actuality it would. And so in a case like this, as the Biot number gets higher, we should of course either do an unsteady two-dimensional analysis such as this, or at least realize that we're going to have to modify the temperature that we base that convection on to get a better estimate of it. And we should always think of this and make sure when we do a lump capacitance analysis that we check the Biot number and know that it is small enough that it is a reasonable approximation. And in addition, if it's questionable, if it's low but probably not low enough, we can at least think about which way that's going to influence our solution and know that we have either an over prediction or an under prediction depending on the scenario.